Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is pneumatic or air motors. Our objective is to introduce air motors and pneumatic systems. We'll learn to interpret pertinent information in an air motor data sheet and discuss air motor construction. Prior to watching this lecture on pneumatic motors, viewers are encouraged to revisit the compressors lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, and play it backwards. While keeping an ear out for any subliminal messages I've hidden in the reverse audio, Viewers will additionally gain a general understanding of air motors since an air motor is essentially the opposite of a compressor. Viewers will recall pneumatic compressors, analogous to pumps in a hydraulic system, are devices that convert the rotational mechanical power output of a prime mover to fluid power output. Pneumatic motors, or air motors in contrast, are actuators that convert pneumatic power input to rotational mechanical power output. Air motors are compressors in reverse. Even the schematic symbol for an air motor tells us it is essentially the opposite of a compressor. Note the errors of a pneumatic motor point inwards, indicating a pneumatic motor consumes pneumatic power, whereas the compressor provides it. Bidirectional pneumatic motors have two inward pointing arrows, whereas unidirectional pneumatic motors have a single inward pointing arrow. If you've watched lectures in the Motors and Generators playlist, you are no doubt aware I am a super fan of three-phase AC electrical motors and you might be surprised to see me dirtying my hands with any rotational actuator other than the very best. Yes, pneumatic motors are noisy, noisy little toys, but I will grudgingly admit they do have their place in modern industrial society, and in occasions exhibit certain advantages over electrical motors. You have no idea how hard it was for me to say that. Air motors are a great fit for flammable atmospheres or clean environments that might not be suitable for electric motors or dirty hydraulic motors. Additionally, air motors can stall at no risk of overheating or damage, as would a continually energized electrical motor in a locked rotor condition. Air motors can be found in numerous applications, including, but not limited to, industrial saws, drills and grinders, and pneumatically powered handheld tools. Just remember to put your hearing protection on when you use them. Since there are so many intriguing parallels between pneumatic and electrical motors, it is hard for me not to compare and contrast the two. Viewers of the pneumatic playlist, however, may or may not have a requisite understanding of electrical circuit analysis. So on a very basic level, one can think of voltage as one would pressure and current as one would flow rate. This is not true, but on an extremely superficial level, it helps to draw analogies between the two different styles of rotational actuators. For electric motors, voltage and current come in and rotational mechanical power comes out. For air motors, pressure and flow come in and rotational mechanical power comes out. Any input power, regardless of form, not converted to usable rotational mechanical power output would be considered a loss. Two properties define rotational mechanical power, rotational speed and the twisting force known as torque. Within the aforementioned motors and generators playlist, I've included a lecture on rotational mechanical power, which I'll quickly summarize here. Rotational mechanical power in units of watts is rotational speed N in units of RPM times torque T in units of newton meters divided by the constant 9.55. Alternatively, you might see this written as 2 pi times torque times speed over 60, or pi times speed times torque over 30, where 9.55 is a rough approximation for this unit conversion constant. One illustrates the performance of rotational actuators like air motors using a speed torque curve with rotational speed in units of RPM on the horizontal axis and torque in units of newton meters on the vertical axis. The speed torque curve for a general purpose air motor at a specific load induced pressure looks something like this. Note the qualifier at a specific load induced pressure. I'll come back to explain how air motor manufacturers account for air motor performance at different load induced pressures in a bit once we complete this general orientation. One can use the speed torque curve to determine a specific motor's working or operating point. At a specific rotational speed, one can determine the torque, or given a known torque, one can determine the speed. One can also plot mechanical power, the product of torque and speed, as a function of rotational speed on another graph. In the case of a general purpose pneumatic motor, mechanical power output in watts plotted as a function of rotational speed in units of RPM forms an almost symmetrical upside down parabolic arc with peak mechanical power output almost center of mass. You will note rotational mechanical power does not peak at high torque nor at high speed conditions but rather these two aspects of rotational mechanical power, speed and torque, form a maximum product. For example, an unloaded shaft could spin super, super fast, but produce no usable torque. Regardless of how fast the shaft was spinning with zero torque, this would be an occasion of zero watts of a rotational mechanical power output. Similarly, a lock shaft could exert significant static torque, however, not move at all. 
regardless of how much static torque the shaft was exerting at zero RPM, this would also be an occasion of zero watts of rotational mechanical power output. Peak rotational mechanical power occurs between these two extremes, center of mass. Several points of interest can be found on air motor speed torque and mechanical power curve. Notably the no load or free speed, the stall torque, the maximum mechanical power point, and the maximum power torque and the maximum power speed. As implied by the title, the no load or free speed is the speed of the shaft when exerting no torque. This is the far right of the speed torque curve. Again, as implied by the title, stall torque is the torque exerted by the motor when it comes to rest from a running condition. Similarly, the maximum power point or maximum output is the peak of the power curve, which typically occurs around 50% of the free speed. The maximum power point is characterized by maximum power torque and maximum power speed. These properties alternatively might be called torque at maximum output or speed at maximum output, depending upon manufacturer. I should note stall torque is different than starting torque. Whereas stall torque occurs to a running motor that is brought to rest, starting torque is the maximum torque produced by a motor in order to initiate rotation from rest. Due to the necessity of breaking static inertia, starting torque is less than stall torque. Starting torque is often illustrated on a speed torque curve using a supplementary torque curve, which looks like a little hill on the left-hand side. While I've got the speed torque and mechanical power curve for an air motor in front of us, it's almost impossible for me not to drag electrical motors into this discussion, at least for comparison purposes. You will note the relatively linear speed torque behavior exhibited by an air motor is very different than the speed torque curve for a typical induction style motor. As one might expect, an induction style electric motor rotational mechanical power curve isn't symmetrical as is an air motor, but rather exhibits a notable rightward lean. Other properties can be plotted in an air motor data sheet. For example, flow rate, Q, in units of standard cubic feet per minute or standard liters per minute or cubic meters per minute, depending upon manufacturer and country of origin. As viewers are no doubt aware, actuator speed is directly dependent on flow rate. Higher speeds necessitate more flow, thus flow rate is an almost linear upward slope. You know, even at stall conditions, an air motor necessitates flow, which is a function of the internal leakage of that specific motor's design and construction. Speaking of stall conditions, viewers with a background in electrical motors will probably wince in pain when I say the word stall. Stalling an electric motor is generally to be avoided for any length of time as motors in a locked rotor condition experience prolonged substantial inrush current, typically six times that of the rated value. All this excess consumption of electrical power in a stall isn't being converted to mechanical power, but rather directed towards self-damage. This is not true for pneumatic motors, perhaps their single greatest advantage. Air motors can be stalled for any length of time without any risk of damage. While we're on the subject of locked rotor conditions, if the application warrants their conclusion, an air motor can be fitted with a spring-applied, pneumatically released friction brake that can hold a load and lock condition in the de-energized state, similar to the manner spring-applied electrically removed friction brakes are used with electric motors. Lastly, I should mention that gearboxes in the head of air motors may modify the speed torque curve. For example, an air motor lacking a gearbox may exhibit the behavior as illustrated in this chart. However, that exact same air motor employing a reducing gearbox where speed is exchanged for torque might exhibit the following behavior. Similarly, the exact same motor fitted with an entirely different gearbox with an even greater reduction ratio might exhibit plots that look like this. Now, at the height of the power curve, the product of increased torque yet equally reduced speed does not change in height, but only width. Depending upon application, a gearbox may or not be fitted to an air motor. Now that we've got a general orientation of the speed torque, mechanical power, and flow rate curves for a general purpose air motor, let's discuss how air motor data sheets account for different load induced pressures. Warning things are about to get messy. In preparation for the stupidity that is about to unfold, allow me to combine all the previous charts we've thus discussed into one tangled mess as you might find from an air motor manufacturer. You'd think they'd illustrate these properties separately, but they don't. Here I've simultaneously plotted torque T in green, mechanical power in brown, and flow rate Q in blue as a function of rotational speed and on the horizontal axis. Yes, it's a little cramped, but given our previous discussion, this chart should be understandable. Torque as a function of speed is a linear downslope. Flow rate Q is a linear upslope. Mechanical power is a symmetric upside down parabola. Three separate vertical scales for torque, mechanical power, and flow rate appear on the left-hand side. To determine torque at a particular speed, one will locate the speed of interest, follow a vertical line till it intersects with the torque curve, and follow it horizontally till it intersects with the torque scale, and then read that data. 
Same thing for mechanical power. At that speed, followed it up till it hits the power curve and then goes horizontally to the intersects of the power scale. Same thing for flow rate. At a speed of interest, follow it up till it hits the flow rate curve then go horizontally till it intersects with the flow rate scale. In summary, it's tight, but usable. We can use this type of chart to determine the motor's operating port, i.e. a condition with a known speed, torque, flow rate, and mechanical power. That's all we need to know, right? Wrong. What about pressure? There are several ways air motor manufacturers account for load-induced pressure, a majority of which are awful and bordering on the unworkable. Method one uses one curve in multiple scales. Method two uses one scale and multiple curves. Method three uses one curve, one scale, and a correction factor table. And lastly, method four uses the internet or manufacturer computer application. Method one uses one curve per property and multiple scales for different load-induced pressure conditions. This method is based on the fact that the previously discussed combined chart is valid only at a specific load-induced pressure, let's say six bar. If load-induced pressure is six bar, use the six bar scale. If however load induced pressure increased to eight bar, one would use the eight bar horizontal and vertical scales that appear parallel to the scales at six. Similarly, if load induced pressure dropped to four bar, one would use the four bar horizontal and vertical scales that appear parallel to the scale at six. Same thing for 10 bar, two bar, etc. This method is workable, however it's a little confusing because you got to remember to use the right scale. Additionally, an air motor data sheet may not illustrate the exact load induced pressure of interest, so you got to do some extrapolation. Method two uses one set of scales and multiple curves for different load induced pressure conditions. If you thought our previous combined chart was cramped, wait till you get a load of this. At a specified load induced pressure, let's say six bar, torque, mechanical power, and flow rate might have curves that look like this. As previously, one finds the intersection with the curve of interest and uses the scale of interest. If however load induced pressure increased to eight bar, the chart includes additional plots for torque, mechanical power, and flow rate that look like this. One finds the intersection with the curve of interest at the pressure of interest in case the darker eight bar curves and uses the scale of interest. Similarly, if load induced pressure dropped to four bar, the chart would include additional plots for torque, mechanical power, and flow rate that look like this. One would find the intersection with the curve of interest at the pressure of interest in this case, the lighter four bar charts and uses the scale of interest. Same thing for two bar, 10 bar, etc. Here's an example of this type of data sheet. For some reason, torque is abbreviated M. Don't ask me why. Viewers will note the vertical scale uses percentage of rated values rather than specific quantities. What you get is a spider web of curves where if you're not paying attention, it's super easy to use the correct curve at the wrong pressure or the wrong curve at the right pressure or worse yet, the wrong curve at the wrong pressure for the wrong motor at the wrong time wearing the wrong shoes. This being said, quite like interacting with your lazy lab partner on a regular basis, with some practice and repeat exposure, you get used to this level of foolishness. Really, the only thing that makes the multiple curves single scale method even remotely usable is colored curves. Think about the bad old days, with black and white printers cramming everything on one chart using solid lines, dashed lines, dotted lines, dashed dot lines, double dash single dot lines and single dash double dot lines. You think I'm joking, but I'm not. Don't get me started on the piece of garbage Penn Foster correspondence courses used by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Apprentice Training Program. Method three, perhaps the most workable of the manual methods, uses one set of scales and one set of curves for each property. However, includes a supplementary table listing proportional modifiers or correction factors for each property at specified load-induced pressures. For example, at a load induced pressure of six bar, let's say the correction vector is one, meaning take everything on this chart and multiply it by one, i.e. don't change it. This chart is good at six bar. If however load induced pressure increased to eight bar, the table might say use a modifier of 1.2, meaning take everything on this chart and multiply it by 1.2. For example, if torque at a specified speed is two newton meters at six bars and we're operating at eight bars, this means the motor would be expected to produce 1.2 times 2 newton meters or 2.4 newton meters of torque. Similarly, if load induced pressure decreased to 4 bar, the table might say use a modifier 0.8, meaning take everything on this chart and multiply it by 0.8. As previously, if torque at a specified speed is 2 newton meters at 6 bar and we're operating at 4 bar, this means the motor would be expected to produce 0.8 times 2 newton meters or 1.6 newton meters of torque. 
I should note that unless explicitly stated otherwise, don't assume that all properties use the same proportional modifier. Often different properties necessitate different modifiers at different load induced pressures. For example, at four bar, an air motor data sheet might say use a modifier 0.8 for torque, but a modifier 0.9 for flow rate and a modifier 0.7 for rotational speed or whatever. As with other manual methods, you often need to extrapolate the given data for different load induced pressures not specified in the table. I should note some manufacturers, rather than employing a table, package the correction factor in another graph. For example, this chart shows everything at six bar needs no modifier, i.e. one. However, at five bar, mechanical power gets maybe a 0.75 correction factor. Both flow rate and torque, again, for some odd reason, abbreviated as M, gets maybe at a 0.82 correction factor, and speed needs to be multiplied by maybe 0.95. Lastly, method four, point and click. Since counting for a range of different load induced pressures is somewhat of a balancing act, Reputable air motor manufacturers often offer interactive data sheets either online or via proprietary software. All a user has to do is plug in a load induced pressure of interest and the utility will generate curves of interest for that exact specified pressure. Additionally, these software utilities can offer suggestions about which air motors, coincidentally from that manufacturer's catalog, might be capable of meeting the desired application specifications. Lastly, I should mention that you're not stuck with what you got. Pressure and flow control methods in a larger pneumatic system can modify a given air motor's performance to meet the specific needs of an application. For example, one could use meter in flow control methods, i.e. supply throttling to push the speed torque curve down in a concave fashion, or meter out flow control methods, i.e. exhaust throttling to push the speed torque curve down in a convex fashion. All right, moving on. Now they've got a brief orientation to air motor data sheets, let's quickly discuss air motor construction and call it a day. As with electrical motors, there are numerous varieties of air motors. Common pneumatic motors can be of the vane, turbine, radial, or axial piston variety. Let's first examine vane style air motors. As I mentioned earlier, air motors are mirror images of compressors, so it's perhaps unsurprising they're similarly constructed. In no case is this more true than a vane motor, which is almost a mirror image of a vane compressor with very subtle modifications. A vane style air motor still consists of an off-center rotor with sliding vanes inside a cam ring. As air enters the cam ring, it pushes on the sliding vanes and turns the rotor. A vane style air motor often has three ports. A clockwise inlet port, a main exhaust, and a counterclockwise inlet port. When air enters the clockwise inlet port, the counterclockwise inlet port serves as a secondary exhaust. To reverse direction of a vane motor, one simply changes the direction of flow. When air enters the counterclockwise inlet port, the clockwise inlet port serves as a secondary exhaust. The main exhaust port may or may not be illustrated on a schematic diagram. Oftentimes, the exhaust port includes a muffler or silencer, which again may or may not be illustrated on the schematic diagram. I should note the starting torque of a vane style air motor is dependent upon angular starting position, as the exposed area of a particular vane is angle dependent. For this reason, the starting torque specified in a vane style air motor data sheet is often the worst case scenario. Turbine style air motor is normally used for high speed, low torque applications. It uses specially shaped turbine blades extend radially from the shaft. As air enters, it pushes on the blades almost like blowing on the blades of a fan. Because the blades of a turbine air motor are shaped to accommodate a specified direction of flow, turbine style air motors are typically unidirectional. Turbine style air motors are often used in pneumatic hand tools, for example, grinders or dental tools that rotate at high speeds. One may also run across piston style air motors of which there are two varieties, radial and axial. As implied by the title, a radial piston air motor uses pistons arranged radially or shooting outwards from the shaft. As air sequentially enters and exits the piston, the piston rods translate the linear piston movement into rotational movement of the shaft. An axial piston motor in contrast uses pistons arranged axially or in line with the shaft. An angled swash plate holds the piston inside the piston block at an angle such that as air enters the piston, the expanding air creates a rotary motion to the swash plate which is transmitted to the motor shaft. Viewers will note axial piston pumps, commonly encountered in hydraulic systems, are almost identical in construction to axial piston air motors. As with vane style air motors, one reverses rotational direction of a piston style air motor, either radial or axial, by changing direction of fluid flow. Piston style air motors are known for their higher torque ratings in comparison to other pneumatic air motors. All right, that's all I got for you today. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the air motor. 
We learned to interpret pertinent data on an air motor data sheet, briefly examine the internal construction of some common styles of air motors. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.